The U.S. Department of Energy has just released its National Clean Hydrogen Strategy, a long-awaited multi-hundred-page report dictating the plan to bring down the cost of hydrogen fuel and propel the development of fuel cell vehicles. This extremely detailed strategy lays out a new vision to scale up U.S. green hydrogen production, which, if reaches the 50 million tons per year mark by 2050, could cut 10% of greenhouse gas emissions between now and the middle of the century. Whether you understand the technology or not, folks, it is pretty clear that hydrogen is going to play a key role in a decarbonization race. We've already seen a lot of progress on the electrification side of things, but for industries like industrial and heavy-duty transport that you simply cannot effectively decarbonize with lithium-ion batteries, hydrogen is going to be the key player. And with the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act having funded regional clean hydrogen hubs and subsidized the production of low-carbon hydrogen with insane production tax credits, the opportunity around the hydrogen production and storage space is larger than it has ever been before. So, how exactly can investors and stakeholders take advantage of this new clean hydrogen strategy? And what exactly does this detail for the real applications that hydrogen can help with? Well, in this video, those questions are exactly what I'm going to address. But as usual, guys, before we get into it, make sure to drop me a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. So to kick things off, let's first understand what this clean hydrogen strategy is even trying to accomplish and the key role that hydrogen plays in the overall clean energy race. And how about we start off with the latter? You see, batteries have helped us decarbonize the electric vehicle race significantly over the past 10 years. We've already been using batteries in consumer electronics for many years now, and that allowed for a scale to bring down the cost of the technology, even if in some cases the technical advantages of lithium-ion cells did not improve nearly as much. This allowed for electric vehicles to be adopted on a larger scale, as seen by the success of someone like Tesla. But when it comes to decarbonizing the overall energy landscape, which includes production, distribution, and then end consumption, that is a much more difficult task to figure out. Because obviously, driving a vehicle is simply the consumption end of the picture. You have to also take into account the industrial, commercial, and transportation side of things, which as we found out, is much more difficult to do. At the end of the day, our current energy ecosystem runs off of digging fuels out of the ground, which we call fossil fuels, processing them, refining them, transporting them to end use cases, and then burning them in jet engines, internal combustion engines, or ships to propel different vehicles. And that right there is where hydrogen plays a key role. Rather than competing with alternative low-cost decarbonization technologies such as electrification and batteries, clean hydrogen adoption will focus primarily on end uses that lack alternatives and are in industries that can build momentum to enable scale, increase benefits, and drive down the cost of the fuel itself. These include refineries like steel manufacturing, glass processing, and even ammonia creation, which has been a big consumer of hydrogen. And that right there is where this new clean hydrogen strategy white paper from the U.S. Department of Energy falls right into place. After having released a preliminary report in September of 2022, the government has completely finalized its advice and strategy on how they will bring down the cost of clean hydrogen and not the one that is produced by fossil fuels. The three key priorities laid out in this report remain the same as in what we saw last year. They include strategic high impact uses for clean hydrogen, reducing the cost of the gas, and building regional clean hydrogen hubs that will make it easier for end users to use and procure the fuel. And in terms of numbers, the goals for domestic clean H2 production remain the same as well for around 10 million tons by 2030, 20 million by 2040, and 50 million tons by 2050. 
And let's be honest, folks, in the very long term, hydrogen is a national security need for the U.S. Japan, Germany, and even India have announced insane plans to invest in production facilities of green hydrogen to end up becoming big exporters of the fuel. This will allow these countries to basically make fuel from renewable energy, which we all know is a form of decentralizing the process of procuring energy resources. This effort is going to take many, many decades, and most likely we're not going to see wide-scale mass adoption of hydrogen fuel every single year until at least 2050. But at least for the next decade or so in reducing carbon emissions, this is going to be a key investment focus for the U.S. government, which is exactly why the DOE has laid out the strategy so that the U.S. can attain its own leadership in this specific sector. Someone like Saudi Arabia, for example, just launched an $8.4 billion facility that is going to be focused purely on the exports of green hydrogen through their recently spun off Neom Green Hydrogen Company. And that follows news of Japan just recently allocating another $107 billion to develop, improve, and procure hydrogen energy throughout the country. These all are going to reduce prices, but only for the countries themselves, meaning it will be ever more important for somebody like the U.S. to invest in its own capacity, because guess what? In the very near future, at some point, fossil fuels are indeed going to be start to phase out. And as for which sectors are going to be those that are phased out first, well, according to the Department of Energy, it's all going to start with electric forklifts, oil refining, clean ammonia, and heavy-duty trucks. Yes, you heard that right, folks. The transportation sector is indeed going to be the first wave of clean hydrogen adoption because of it having the highest break-even point for dollar per kilogram. As you can see in the clean hydrogen strategy report, the threshold price for commercial trucks and buses is going to be just under $5 per kilogram for clean hydrogen. That falls right around the range that current electrolysis technologies are priced in at, with forklifts being around $7 to $6, which is exactly why it is currently the biggest market for hydrogen fuel cells in North America, with over 50,000 electric hydrogen forklifts in play today. This means that an immediate benefit to the environment can be seen by investing in medium and heavy duty vehicles first with hydrogen. Biofuels, steel, ammonia will come later on because they will require much more cost reductions to become effective over the long term and competitive with fossil fuel based resources. And the only way the government is going to achieve these goals is by conducting three main steps which is targeting high impact end uses for hydrogen, which includes heavy duty trucking, ammonia, and natural gas production, reducing the cost of the fuel itself by investing in capital and technology, and then lastly, focusing on regional networks, meaning making sure that end use is close to production as fast as possible to reduce distribution and logistics cost. Applications of clean hydrogen in the very first wave of adoption will indeed be jump-started by existing markets that have very few alternatives. But in the long term, fuel cells will become an equitable role in all the other electrification sectors because of the benefits they provide with recharging times, practicality, and energy density. Essentially, through effective collaboration, strategic partnerships, and with the right policy in place, the United States can indeed succeed in the development of a sustainable, resilient, and equitable clean hydrogen economy. And that is exactly what this report from the DOE is aiming to do. As usual, folks, let me know your thoughts about this report down in the comment section below. Do you think this is a viable strategy and is this going to make a difference in the production cost of hydrogen and the cost to end users? As usual, let me know your thoughts and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Take care.